A big piece of what will lead to success for the New Orleans Saints offense in 2023 is going to be Derek Carr's ability to translate offensive terminology. What are some examples of how complicated that can be? We get all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome in to another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and keep the conversation going one-on-one with me over at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Saints. As always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media, senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site, covering the New Orleans Saints. You can also find me every Tuesday on Locked on NFL and here with you every single Monday through Friday and then some on Locked on Saints. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, we're going to get to a few quotes from OTAs, some video and all that from some interviews that we've done. We'll take a look at what Foster Moreau had to say about Jawan Johnson, and we'll discuss how the two can complement one another. We'll also take a look at Dennis Allen on why OTA attendance really matters. Why have we been discussing it? Why are we so excited about it for the New Orleans Saints have been there? We'll get to that. But first, I want to start off with the adjustment period ahead of Derek Carr, because in order for the New Orleans Saints offense to be successful in 2023, one of the many things that has to fall in place and amongst the things that have to improve from 2022 It's sort of this new factor of being able to translate offensive language from the scheme and from the system and the playbook for the Las Vegas Raiders to the scheme, system, and playbook for the New Orleans Saints. And that's not always the most simple task. And so I wanted to give some solid examples of what this can look like for a quarterback. Before we get to some of those examples, here's Derek Carr in response to Taryn Walk's question from over at NOLA.com kind of discussing the process so far in terms of making those translations from one offense to another. Yeah, I think just during OTAs, it should happen pretty naturally. You know, today, just calling plays and, you know, spitting them out, boom, 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 and, you know, doing those things, That that's where it's just going to, you know, wash out the other stuff. And just getting into this, getting into the meetings, you know, you have the meetings before, you got the, you know, you got the practice, you got the walkthrough, you got the meetings after, you got, you know, going back and studying afterwards when you get home and all those things. And so for me, you know, just getting into that world, you know, uh, it's one thing to see it on a screen and read it on a page, but you got to go do it. And so I've been, I've been walking around my house. My, my little daughter knows our, you know, snap count, you know, she's been saying it back to me because I've been yelling it through the house as I'm calling plays and doing things. So, uh, it's been pretty funny, but I think that as we, you know, grow through these practices, these OTAs, it's, it's a good time for me to just grow into that. So that when I hit camp, I'm like, all right, now let's go, let's just go win. You know, I'm trying to win. And also trying to learn at the same time right now. Uh, but, you know, hopefully through these OTAs, it'll just become natural. So when you hear Derek Carr talking about it, you can already hear some of the intricacies that goes into it. So a couple of little takeaways there. Just first of all, hearing a little bit more about sort of the process of what it's like to be in that situation to where you're you're in the classroom, you're doing all the studying. Then you go out, you're practicing, you're doing walkthroughs, you're going back to more meetings after that. You're studying at home, just sort of him laying out what the process is in a bare bones way in terms of how all of it comes together during OTAs. And then the other piece of it is him doing it. I mean, just having to get it done. The follow-up question from Taryn on that was, so you're more of a learn from doing kind of a guy. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. I have to go out there and do it. And so this is when you also hear the comment that we brought up earlier in the week around his daughter knowing the snap counts because he's been walking around the house and shouting them out while he's been practicing all of the play calling. So let's just look at a little bit of an example here of what it looks like, the different ways that things could translate from one offense to another. So I have three examples here. There's sort of the example of different execution, but the same verbiage. There's just complete differences. And then there's differences of verbiage, even though the uh, the execution is different. So this first one is an example of teams that use the same verbiage, but it means two different things. Now, I'm not pulling this directly from any playbooks. I don't have access to any playbooks in the NFL. Nobody does. All this stuff. So just I'm, I'm creating some things here. So let's say that the Saints are using protection calls 
like 52 and 53. The 52 and 53 protection calls traditionally throughout the NFL have been seven step drop back. So that's protection calls for a passing play in which the quarterback takes a deep drop in their in their step. But let's just say that 52 and 53 in the Saints offense might mean a seven step deeper drop, but in the Raiders offense might mean a five step drop. So it's different execution, even though it's the same language of 52 and 53. The Saints could have also introduced something entirely new to that as well. In the past, the Saints have used 352 and 353 to represent those same protection responsibilities to the offensive lineman, but instead of a seven-step drop, it's a three-step drop, hence throwing the three in front of it. That, for instance, may not even be an option in the Raiders' playbook to have a three-step drop under those same protection rules. So that's an example of something that the Saints could be intro- introducing that would be brand new, or the the example of what it would be like to, to introduce something that's brand new. The other one is that you have the same executions where two teams do the same things, but they just have different names for it. So for instance, uh, let's say that you have a run play that's going to the right side of the offense. Where the run play is headed is considered the front side. Where it's going away from is considered the back side. So if the run is going to the right, the right side of the offensive line is on the front side. The left side of the offensive line and offense are on the back side of that run play. So the Saints might have a, let's say, a protection call or an alignment call, rather, that calls for the guard to be closer to the center on the backside of the play. They might call that sink. But then in other executions on the offense, on the the Saints offense, they may want the guard to be tighter to the center on the play side instead. So they might call that swim. So they might use sink and swim. The Raiders could have the exact same idea in their playbook and the exact same execution in their playbook a front side, back side designation, guard being in tighter to the center, but maybe on the back side in the Raiders offense, they'll call it uh, solid, but then on the front side on the Raiders offense, uh, they might call it uh, squeeze. And so instead of having sink and swim, you might have solid and squeeze. So it's just an example, a couple of examples of how like these little things could be very different, even though they're all the same. You know, similarly, you know, Falcon left, Falcon right might mean in one offense where the F position designation lines up left or right, or they might use like wink or sink to say like weak or strong, something like that. But that might be your difference. One might say left and right. The other might say weak and, you know, weak and strong and go wink and sink. So you have the W and S. There's so many different ways that the NFL kind of, you know, tries to disguise its verbiage. And that's just the playbook stuff, not to mention the fact that teams will oftentimes change some of their on-field signals that they'll call during the plays uh, while they're on, while they're already at the line of scrimmage as opposed to in the huddle, they might change those signals on a week to week basis. So there's so much that you kind of have to learn if you're a quarterback in the NFL and that and that is transitioning from one team to the other. So just because the two teams might have run these West Coast style offenses does not mean that they're the same. So mastering the vocabulary differences and the changes is kind of the big part of Derek Carr's Uh, process right now. So that as he said, once they get into training camp, they're ready to get ready to win as opposed to being in a situation where they're still learning the offense. They want to get that out of the way here in OTAs. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important, the presence during OTAs. We've made a big deal about it this year, but we haven't really talked about why. So we're going to get to Dennis Allen's quote specifically around Tyron Matthew. We'll have a little honey badger conversation because there is something to be said about what does a Tyron Matthew breakout season look like for the New Orleans Saints in comparison to his last season? And uh, why OTA presence is important and could lead to exactly that. Got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Saints brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar in all the land. It doesn't get any better than this. You can head over to Built.com right now to see the entire catalog of their collection and the incredible collection of flavors that they have, including things like uh, birthday cake. Sometimes they have those kind of special limited uh, availability flavors that go super quickly. Peanut butter puff bars, which kind of have that sort of like fluff or nutter feel. And you're talking about all these bars being covered in 100% chocolate, but having only 130, 140 calories, four or five grams of sugar, while you're still getting the 17, 18 grams of protein you need to get through the rest of your day. So you can check them out over at Built.com. You can head over to Walmart. They've got some of their most popular flavors there in four bar boxes over in the pharmacy section. So you can find them there at Walmart. And if you head over to Sam's Club, you can also get 13 bar boxes 
of churro puff as well as brownie batter puff, which are huge hit flavors for Built. So make sure you go and check them out today. The best tasting protein bar on the market, Walmart, Sam's Club, and of course, Built.com. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate you as always being a Locked on Saints, your first listen of the day every day for all you everydayers out there. We've been doing these two a days too, and they've been a lot of fun. Best believe we we plan to continue them going into uh, next week. Monday's morning episode is going to be taking a look at the offense for OTAs. What's the next thing that we're looking for? And then we'll kind of look at attendance in the live show. Who are we hoping maybe is you know, added to the attendance list when it comes to the second week of OTAs. Tuesday, we'll do the same thing. In the morning, we'll take a look at the defensive side. What are we watching for? And then I'll give you all of your OTA uh, kind of reports all throughout the rest of the week, including live shows Monday through Thursday. So appreciate you very much as always for being here with us. Next thing I wanted to kind of go over here is why OTA attendance? Question mark. Just simply why OTA attendance? I mean, usually year after year after year, especially since the 2020 season, we've kind of you know, started to say things like, well, veterans not showing up for voluntary OTAs makes a lot of sense and all that. So why was this year different? And I think a big part of the reason that this year was so different is because you have, you know, an entirely new defensive line for the most part in terms of your starting defensive line might be entirely new based upon what it was from last year with the exception of Cam Jordan. Uh, You have a brand new quarterback over in the offensive side. That's enough to get your offense there. So there's all of these sort of big pieces and you have all of these defensive coaches, this new defensive coaching staff, new tight end coaching staff, all that with Clancy Barone, um, you know, an additional or in ad- the addition of Jari Evans, the offensive line coaching staff, all that. So there's enough change all over the roster and personnel, whether it be coaching or players that uh, attendance simply makes sense. But even for the veterans that are the ones that we usually say, hey, you know, it's voluntary OTAs, them not being there is a big deal. It becomes kind of important this year for them to be around. And that's sort of a, a part of what makes it important, too, is just simply the way that the team treats it. And so if top down, the team treats it as, hey, we want as many people here as possible, then it becomes more important. And the Saints have usually kind of been the team that says, hey, don't worry about it, just show up for training camp. And that's what we've seen over the course of the past couple of years, because Sean Payton and the New Orleans Saints were the first team during the, uh, as the, the COVID season was kind of beginning to where he said, hey, everyone just go home. Everybody go home, get ready for training camp, be with your families. You don't need to be here right now, all that. Um, the next year, the NFL players kind of, for lack of a better phrase, kind of boycotted or sat out, I guess is really the better way to say it, OTAs, because the CBA between the NFL and the NFLPA, both parties are just dragging their feet and not getting the CBA done. And so players uh, stepped away from that. And then last year was just sort of a continuation of that same sort of level of, yeah, this isn't really necessary. It's voluntary, not going to be there. Now, all of a sudden this year, 79, 80 of 90 different players on the Saints roster all show up for OTA. So why all of a sudden is it important? So I want to roll this clip first from Dennis Allen talking a little bit about the impact of having Tyron Matthew present. I think this was in response to Ed Daniels question over at WGNO. Um, And just sort of speaking a little bit on sort of the veteran nature of it all, but he kind of gets to the core of why it's important as a whole for your roster to be present during OTAs. Every opportunity you're out here, or every time you're out here, it's an opportunity to get better. And every one of our players, coaches, everybody can get better at something. I don't care how far advanced you are in your career. There's things that you can do to improve. And so um, I'm happy he's here. I'm excited about him being here. Um, I think he's, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he's probably more comfortable in the system. Um, and, And so I think that'll bode well for him, you know, in terms of throughout this process and into training camp as we get into the start of the regular season. Now, you remember at the beginning of the 2023 season throughout camp OTAs and stuff like that, like we saw Tyron Matthew early on in the process. And then at the beginning of training camp, he had, he wasn't there. And then all of a sudden he, you know, showed back up and everything. And, you know, we, we assume some of that was family related stuff, or we know that some of that was family related stuff and everything that was going on there. And so, the now now you have the inverse of that or the opposite of that it's where you know Tyron Matthew was out there for the first OTA practice and he's been out there working with the team in fact one of the earlier quotes from Dennis Allen that I almost used instead of this quote was him talking about Foster Moreau and one of the things that he mentioned was that you know it's great to see Foster Moreau out there and sort of the early exposure that they've had with him but he's also been been there for the last 10 days and so basically since Foster Moreau signed he's been out there and so much like I've I've kind of highlighted Demario Davis in that, yeah, he wasn't present at the first day of OTAs when we were present, but there's several photos that show him 
in the Saints training facility working with guys like Chris Olave. Tyron Matthew was a part of that workout as well. Uh, Alante Taylor, you can look at Tyron Matthew the same way, and you can look at a lot of these other veterans the same way, because just because we're not seeing them on the field doesn't mean that they're not somewhere in the classroom, in the meeting room, in the weight room, all of, you know, so on and so forth, as we discussed here on the show before. But for all of that, there's value. There's value in being present. There's value in putting in work. There's value in getting to know the new faces and getting to understand what changes might come, especially over on the offensive side, where you have to expect changes to be there, like Pete Carmichael showing up with black Air Force Ones type type changes. Like we just never know. And so I think that for New Orleans, and when you have leaders like Tyron Matthew and Cam Jordan and Derek Carr, which you knew Derek Carr was going to be there. He's brand new to the team. But even for the guys that have been there for so long, and especially a guy like Cam Jordan, who's always at OTAs and is always present uh, and is very publicly saying things like it's so much easier to buy in when you don't choose to remove yourself or to something, something to that effect. Um, that that's kind of the lesson of all of this is that one of the reasons why OTA performance is so important is because it allows you to buy in. And I think the Saints are in a position to where they need buy in, not that they lack it, but that they're a team that needs buy in because they're two years coming up short of the playoffs, which is not a part of what this team's identity has been since 2006. Let's just be real. Um, they're also, well, I, I mean, with the exception of 2014, 15 and 16, but we don't talk about those years. And then, you know, you, you have all of the changes, you have all these other things, you have the doubt that surrounds this team, but you have a very winnable division and generally speaking, a very winnable conference for the top teams in the conference. Can the New Orleans Saints be one of those top teams? You certainly hope so. And you certainly believe that they have the tools to do so. But here during OTAs is where the work begins. One of the things that we've discussed and that Derek Carr kind of echoed in, an, in, in a comment during his, I'll just call it post-practice presser after the first day of OTAs is that you spend a lot of time during OTAs doing the familiarity, the chemistry building, the team building, the understanding, the, the vocabulary, what we were just kind of doing in the first segment of today's show, which kind of feels a little bit like a, maybe like a late week fundamentals as opposed to a midweek fundamentals. But, you know, those things, you get all that stuff and iron all those wrinkles out during OTAs. You don't have to iron those out when everyone shows up for mandatory minicamp. You don't have to iron those out when everybody shows up for training camp. You, you can just hit the ground running. And so that's another reason why this OTA presence is being made such a big deal of uh, this year as opposed to previous years. And, and the last thing that I'll mention on this too, just to, to Dennis Allen's credit, um, last year at this time, there were a lot of question marks around, does Dennis Allen have the respect of his team? You know, is the team going to, you know, is the team rejecting Dennis Allen? Is the team rallying around Dennis Allen? Whatever. Like all of these talking points that came from the lack of presence at OTAs. Now you have massive attendance at OTAs, 90% of the roster, and Dennis Allen confirming that he has had contact with the 10 players that were not there. Some of them are injury related. Some of them are reasons are unclear, but don't, don't matter to the Saints, clearly. Not, they matter, but, you know, they're not going to, they're not upset about the fact that like this player wasn't there or whatever. Um, and then an expectation that those players will be there for mandatory mini camps. It's very clear that Dennis Allen has a grip on what, you know, the team is, who the team is, and that the team has absolutely has the respect for Dennis Allen that some people were questioning at this time last year. So just another example of why this team is in a better place this year at this time than it was last year at this time. And hopefully they can continue that trajectory into success in the regular season once they actually get on the field and all the chips matter. Coming up next, we'll get to a clip from Foster Moreau. I asked him about Jawan Johnson and if he's seen any similarities in terms of his uh, time with guys like Darren Waller when what he sees in Jawan Johnson. And he gave a, a glowing review. So we'll get to that and discuss sort of how these two players complement one another and can help build this New Orleans Saints offense and help it ascend to another level. I got that coming up for you as we continue on our wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it. Houdat Nation, wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints with a quick look at the tight end duo. I hope you caught yesterday's live show, whether you caught it live or later. We kind of looked at how this tight end trio could end up being a thing for New Orleans between uh, Juwan Johnson, who continues to get better and bigger every time that we see him, and then Foster Moreau, the exciting new addition who has been working for double-digit days at the New Orleans Saints facility, said that there is not an ounce of concern with his ability to physically make it throughout a 2023 season, that he'll be on the field week one, all of these things. There were so many people saying 
the Foster Moreau deal like doesn't matter. He's not going to ever, he's not going to play in 2023, all this other stuff. Even after we were sitting here on the show saying, no, everything that we're being told is that we are expecting to see him at OTAs. And I think maybe there are still doubters, but so far, everything that we see tells us that Foster Moreau is just fine and we'll be, we'll be playing football nonstop unless something else unforeseeable happens. But there's also Lucas Kroll, the uh, tight end. Most most recently of the Pittsburgh Panthers, probably most notably, right, of the Pittsburgh Panthers, but spent some time with the Florida Gators as well. I think it's important, the SEC designation there. Uh, but, you know, these three guys could turn into something here for New Orleans. And the, the Saints who, you know, I, I spoke with, we did our, Doug Mouton and I did our recording for fourth down on four uh, for this weekend. And one of the things that we were discussing, uh, you know, kind of offline on that was how the Saints have sort of always had this depleted tight end room, especially since Jimmy Graham. And they tried to fill it with Kobe Fleener and Michael Haomanawa Nui and Josh Hill. They they brought back Benjamin Watson. They made the run with Jared Cook. They drafted Adam Troutman. They drafted Tommy Stevens and tried to turn him into a tight end. I mean, they have looked for so many different solutions at that position and have never had a consistently viable threat outside of maybe the first year of Jared Cook, but really have never had anything that will amount to where Jimmy Graham was. And you're probably never going to have another Jimmy Graham, really not in my lifetime. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a chance that that never happens again in New Orleans, but to have three guys that might be able to, you know, uh, morph into, <laughs> you know, a, a one Jimmy Graham, that's still a big time win for New Orleans. And it might not need to be three guys. It might be two guys and you have an extra third that helps to put you over the top. And that's maybe where Lucas Kroll comes in. But it's clear that Foster Moreau, who had his first practice with the Saints on Tuesday, uh, has a lot of respect for Juwan Johnson and what the two can be together. Here's what Foster had to say. You know, uh, I can't speak too much for Juwan. Um, I can speak a little bit on him. Uh, I I think he's an exceptional leader, first and foremost. Uh, I think he takes it extremely serious, especially in this off-season training program. He knows it's the time to get better. Um, And I, I look forward to him being an invaluable resource for me and my development. I think he's a really good player. So I, I kind of love the fact that the first thing that Foss Moreau points out about Juwan Johnson is that he's a fantastic leader. He goes straight to his leadership capabilities because I don't think that's a conversation that we have very often. We don't often look at the tight end position and say, oh, well, that player can be a leader on the offense. And if you think about it, the Saints could really use that. Uh, you look over on the defensive side, they have leaders at all at every level. You've got uh, a, a Cam Jordan on the defensive line. You've got a Demario Davis in the in, 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 on the second level at, at at linebacker. You've got Tyron Matthew at safety and with the defensive backs. You've got uh, Marshall Lattimore at, at corner as well. Um, somebody had a really interesting pick. Let me see if I can find it real quick because it was from the it was from the subtext group. But somebody had a really interesting pick for a uh, breakout player in 2023, uh, being Marcus May, which I thought was really, really good, uh, which I thought was a really, really solid uh, selection. And the thing that I love about that, it was uh, Nate Lyon. And the thing that I love about that is that like, you could just see all the different places where the Saints can ha- like, have that veteran leader on the, over on the defensive side. On the offensive side, you, you're just trying to get the quarterback position to be that player. And you've probably got that now that you've got Derek Carr. But, uh, and, and you had it with Jameis as well, even though it was you know emotional leadership, it was and he didn't get an opportunity to really be the on the field leader because he couldn't he couldn't you know he had these debilitating injuries early on in the seasons and stuff like that. Andy Dalton is a, a respectable player around the NFL, but he didn't have the fire that you see like a guy like Derek Carr, who by the way has a chip on his shoulder because the team that he never wanted to leave gave up on him, and so now he's with the team that wants him, and so he brings that chip on his shoulder, and it's again it's loud leadership. Um, but who else over on the offensive side? I mean, you hope for Michael Thomas to be that person, but similarly to uh, Jameis Winston, he he hasn't been able to be on the field for the past few years. Maybe that changes this year, fingers crossed. Um, Alvin Kamara certainly took on the emotional leader tag last year when he gave the impassioned speech in the locker room after the Thursday night loss against the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, he was you know holding everybody accountable and asking people to hold themselves accountable, but you know who else do you have there? And so maybe there is an opportunity for guys like Chris Olave, first of all, to grow into that role over time. But for right now, maybe Juwan Johnson can become that other guy. And Foster Moreau helps you there as well as another veteran. Maybe you get that from some of the offensive linemen. I'll tell you, like getting to talk to Cesar Ruiz um, and, and see him around on Tuesday 
he, just jovial. I mean, like probably the most uh, boisterous that I've seen him. And and he's coming off an injury, so maybe he can become that guy, which would be a huge asset for him in a contract year, effectively, to be able to say, hey, I'm here and I can be a leader for this unit. So there's a lot of interesting ways that it all pans out. But you know, you look at the the sort of way that guys like Foss Monroe and Juwan Johnson compliment one another. The reason why they compliment one another is because both of them can do anything that you ask them to do. You want one of them to stay in line as a blocker. Juwan Johnson has gotten so much better in that part of the, uh, part of his game. Uh, and when I say better, it doesn't mean that he was bad. It's just that he wasn't asked to do it because he was playing wide receiver coming into the NFL. He had to learn to become that inline blocker. And he's done a fantastic job with that. Every time we see him, he just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And he looks great. And he looks great out on the field as well. Plus, you also see him, you know, down the seam catching passes and things like that. And Foss Moreau, you see the same thing. A good inline blocker that can be a true eye, but that can also move out for you. You can put him in the slot. You can throw the ball to him. He can be that sort of split motion, that split in motion that you know I always love. And Brandon Olson over at Lockdown Gators is in love with as well, where the tight end starts on one side of the formation. After you snap the ball, he crosses behind the offensive line to the other side of the formation to either pick up the unblocked defender on the backside of a play or to leak open uh, in the flats. And so lots of different things that you can do with both of those guys. And, and, and because they are so versatile, because they are so... Uh, multifaceted, they complement one another because the thing that you ask one of them to do, you can ask the other to do the opposite and vice versa, or you ask them both to go and do the same thing. Go out there and block, go out there and, and catch passes. And so the Saints should have a really effective 12 personnel attack in 2023, which would mean one running back and two tight ends, which is usually a run heavy formation, but the Saints will be able to pass out of that. And if Lucas Kroll takes the steps that you'd love to see him take as well, then that type of which would mean, by the way, when I say take steps, let me not be general. If he improves as a blocker, if he shows you that he can line up in line and block those gaps, sort of like what we discussed that um, you know Dennis Allen said that they want to see from him, his ability as a downfield receiver and attacking the seam and being you know a one cut route running guy, all those things that Dennis Allen praised, get more opportunities because he hits the field. And so the Saints then have not only sort of this disguise that they can use in 12 personnel, but they can also rotate the personnel literally. And sometimes that's Foster Moreau and Juwan Johnson. Sometimes it's Juwan Johnson and Lucas Kroll. Other times it's Lucas Kroll and Foster Moreau are all out on the field together. And you never know, based upon which deployment of those two tight end sets that they use, and oh, by the way, Taysom Hill probably factors into there as well, but it never telegraphs anything over to the defense. It's all disguise. So if you think about how important it was for the Saints to add Marcus May and Tyron Matthew last year because they wanted the disguise... Which, by the way, we still haven't really gotten to see much of that pairing on the field. We've never seen the full starting five. So that's a whole new thing that could potentially hit the Saints offense in 2023. You can get that same level of ability to disguise on the offensive side because of your versatility at tight end. So that's why I think that the combination of these guys is so important and why it's great to see the respect that they have for one another. All right, coming up on Monday's episode, what are we expecting to see over on the offensive side when it comes to OTAs for the second week? Keep an eye out. I'm thinking about doing like a super casual Saturday Q&A over on the Locked on Saints YouTube page that I'll try to make sure it gets everywhere, but it, it won't really have a format. It won't really be a show. It'll just be me like kicking it and taking questions and just talking and stuff like that. So it'll be a lot of fun, hopefully. Uh, so we'll see. I'll keep you up to date on all that. But I appreciate you as always for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, a part of your routine. For all the everydayers out there, thank you so much for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you want to, if you want to continue the conversation one-on-one, -on -one, you can head over to joinsubtext.com slash locked on saints. And as always, if you need anything around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're moming them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.